Well, good morning, everyone. Let's get started today on this wonderful, bright, shiny Sunday morning after a little bit of rain yesterday and last night. But it was a good day most of the day. It gave us time to have kind of a facelift. I guess you noticed that. Kind of an extensive facelift on the church outside. We put some pictures on the internet and got a lot of people responding, but you know, now, now we're here today and it's time let's all stand together. My brother, you know, worked with, it, with his favorite landscaper yesterday and he said, now tomorrow if I can't stand up, you'll know why. <laughs> give, him a, give him a break, right? Amen. Let's just ask God to touch us today and uh, give us strength and meet us in a special way. The uh, discouragement is able to be lifted by God's encouragement. God can take us from the mighty clay and put us on the solid rock. Amen to that. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, this Sunday morning, and this time to be together. We thank you for those that are here, and we have no doubt that others are on the way. And we thank you for those that are joining us by way of social media, both right now and in real time, and later on as they might watch the service. We're thankful that we can reach out. We have so many friends that are with us and praying for us, whether here or someplace else. But the most important thing is that you are with us. You said you'd be with us always. You said you would never leave us, and you would never forsake us. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. And everybody say a good amen. Amen. This is a, a song about going to heaven. In my Father's house and many mansions, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. This goes back. A lot of folks think this is just a song for the children, but it's not. It's a song of truth. It talks about what Jesus has prepared for us. I've got a home in glory land that I'll shine the sun. I've got a home in glory land that I'll shine the sun. I've got a home in glory land that I'll shine the sun.
say his heart and God's grace will live
So he right his hands right now. Say, Lord, take control of this. Help us. I like closure, but sometimes you don't get closure. I like all the answers, but sometimes you don't get the answers. Amen? So what do you do? Amazing grace, I'll speak this out. Grace, my fears relieved. Do you have fears today? Do you have anxieties today? By the grace of God, we need you right now. We set you free. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, not anymore. Oh, but now. Wonderful, wonderful. God is good. More than we realize. He is wonderful, wonderful, and glorious. Well, I'm going to share a number of things with you, and I hope I get this all right. You know, my wife tries to help me, and I don't know if everything's going to be in chronological order. First of all, I did make a reference at the beginning of the service, and I will again to the kind of the facelift, kind of the facelift. <clears throat> And, and, and the only reason they didn't get more done is because it started raining about 3.30, 4 o'clock, and the day was ending. But my brother with his friend Scott Robinson, landscaper from not West Palm Beach, but Palm Beach. He is a guy who takes care of the mansions, you know. He uh, had done a lot of work at the school, and he knows my brother, so my brother got together with him, and my brother donated all the, the goods, and, and Scott with his crew of what, how many people did he have? Four people yesterday. It looked like there was a, more than the way they moved around. Donated all of their services and uh, did all this for us. We didn't have to put out one penny. Even took care of their own refreshments and food and everything. So thank God for that's a miracle, you know. And, and some of this stuff was going to have to be done, needed to be done, other things, and just like a little extra. And uh, so, uh, you know, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have made an investment and in things like that. But God said, let's just. Take care. I, I was going to announce this morning that uh, the Evangel Motel has been put out of business. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. That hedge, it served a lot of people during the pandemic up until recent times, and I let them stay there, and they spend the night, and I figured, hey, folks, you can't, you can't just stop people from spending the night somewhere. And for a long time, uh, did a pretty good job of keeping it clean, and then right in the last few months, it just... It turned it into a mess and left all kinds of garbage, and so we had to clean that out. And we had, we had some help with that, and so uh, I, my brother said, "Well, let's just see if Scott can maybe just get it out. And we'll start from scratch." And uh, you know, I'm not. I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's there's a, there's a gentleman that sleeps next to the fence a lot of time during the day. Does that, does that bother me? No. You know, you just if, when somebody these people are not people that, that really they might get a little sloppy sometimes, but they're not they're not going to damage your place. It's not the people they're, they're not not going to damage the places they use for shelter. And some people did some illegal dumping, and part of that that's back in there on the other property was on was a little bit over. I don't think it was on our property, but when I came and, and I asked my brother, I said, "Well, that's all been organized and put back over there." And did you guys? They said, "No, the, the, the guy that was sleeping there did that." So hey. Somebody said, I think Scott said, like an angel's unaware. But anyway, uh, we, we, we're thankful for that. So uh, Scott's going to probably, oh, and by the way, the, the, one of the things he said, let this be a, a birthday present for my father, for his 100th birthday. So I think Scott's going to try to be with us for that service, which I'll, I'll mention this next. We're going to honor my dad's 100th birthday on March 28th. That's Palm Sunday, but we'll be here, and then we're going to have, you don't have to bring anything. Everything's taken care of. You know, something to eat right after the service. Be right over here. And a uh, hundred years old. Huh. So my, my, my dad's youngest sister, my Aunt Ruth, and she's the only one of the children besides my dad that's still alive. She lives in Arkansas. She sent me some, some pictures and things. She had the newspaper clippings announcing that my mother was engaged in my father. The actual clippings. And then uh, also... Uh, the announcement of the wedding and the pictures. And uh, we've been doing a lot of digging. We're going to have some things that you can see. We, we were kind of, uh, Gloria Jackson's coming over. Remember her? She's been here off and on many times. She, she was digging around in the football business. And so I, I did some looking at it. And she did some. And 
We happened to find my dad in a couple of places, but we got, we got a football program from the University of Miami in 1941. It was his second year in school. In those days, you had to play on the freshman team first, so he was on the varsity, and you know what happened later. You know, He said his uncle took his football jersey away. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so, but we put the, yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're going to show you some of those pictures, but I sent that to, to, to his sister. You know, these, these people have, uh, you know, had a lot of experiences like many of you have had and all of us. But uh, it's nice to think about these things. But we're rooted in the present and we're letting God handle the future. And if there's anything troubling you from the past, just put it in the Lord's hand. But there's some wonderful things to remember. So that's going to be on March 28th. Now, before that, March 21st, that's going to be BGMC Sunday and the beginning of the new BGMC year. We'll share a few special things with you, a video and, and different things. And, uh, you know, we do that every year, March 21st, okay? So that's the week before Palm Sunday. But here, here's the thing I want you to get down. I mean, I mean, the other things are good, but I want you to get that down in your mind, okay? You know what I'm going to say? March 14th, next Sunday, the time's going to change. And it's the bad one. If you miss this, you won't be here when we have church. See, if you miss this one, you're going to come in here 12 o'clock and not 11 o'clock. So get it, please. Spring ahead. Remember, put your clocks ahead next Sunday. We can't afford to take any kind of a problem. So remember that. Next Sunday. So it's March 14th and then the 21st BGMC Sunday and then March 28th, which is Palm Sunday. And then, of course, the next week is Easter yeah, the Lord willing and the Lord tarrying. And then I would also like to say, because we, we're going to have communion today, you, you can see that, that's rather obvious. One of the things that announces itself when you come in the door. But one thing I'd like to mention is that if you have been with us, you know this, but if not, if you can try to catch the Wednesday night Bible study at 7.30 on our Facebook page, James Counts, and then uh, there's copies of it. Like, it, like the other services there and also on YouTube under that same name. Uh, this, the, the, almost all the services are there. I make copies of them. I told you why. And we share them with people. But you can go there. But what we're doing is we're not just having a Bible study, which we do. That's what you're supposed to do when you have a Bible study. But we're studying about the Bible. Talking about how the Bible's put together and all the different divisions of the Bible and different books of the Bible and what they all mean. And you might say, well, is it just like a class, uh, just in about, no, it, it gets into the Word of God, believe me, I mean, we, we talk plenty about the Scripture and what it says, but we need to know the Word of God, we need to know why there's an Old Testament or New Testament, like last Wednesday night we talked about why are there four Gospels, there's not four different stories of Jesus that are different, there's not four Gospels, there's only one Gospel, but there's four Gospel accounts in the New Testament, and we explained, and I won't get into that because if I do, I won't get stopped. We explained all about that and other things. So what we what we have done is we're studying the Bible and how it's put together. But just starting last week, since it's the, the month of Easter, and we're moving towards Easter, uh, we're going to go into the Gospels and work it around what the Gospels say. And, of course, that takes us to the Easter story. Now, it's close many times because of the way the calendar works. It's a little off sometimes because of the way the calendar works. But this year, Passover is going to be the same as the week between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, like it was in the Bible when Jesus and his disciples came for Passover, that particular Passover. You know, I always get a kick out of this. One of my professors told me this, and I have no idea why I need to know because it, until I don't have calendars. But it, even then, it says that Easter is the first Sunday, uh, the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. And somebody in the class said, how are we supposed to know when the vernal equinox comes? He said, check a calendar. We thought, well, we don't look on the calendar for Easter. But anyway, and, and that's a little bit about how they figure Passover, but sometimes the calendar's a little bit different. You know the calendar system lacks a little bit because of the way, uh, you know, our solar system works. You know, the solar calendar, the lunar calendar, that's why you have to add that extra day every four years for leap year, and there's other problems with it. But at any rate, we know when Easter is, and we know when Passover is. And the reason why we put an emphasis on Passover is because that's how Jesus came to be the Passover lamb. To have the last supper with the disciples, that's what we're celebrating in our service today. So God is going to use all of these things. So if you get a chance, I want to emphasize it. We take about a half hour, give or take a little bit, on Wednesday night. And we, it's just the pastor sitting at the table. 
And I never thought I'd be doing such a thing, but I enjoy it. And it reaches so many people. And so many people respond to it and make comments. And we thank God for that. So uh, try, try to catch it if you possibly can, especially this month when we are highlighting the Gospels. All right, let's re receive our offering. I, I got it all covered, I think, and, and got it all right. Okay, so come on down, fellas, we appreciate that. Appreciate your faithfulness. The Lord does, he honors faithfulness. See, God's a, a, a merciful God and a forgiving God and a God of grace, but he wants you to serve him. He wants you to make time to show him that you love him and care about him. Amen. So let's just look to the Lord. He's just going to pray that God will give you a great blessing today. Amen. So Father, thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be in your house today, Father. Father, I just want to pray to you, Father, that you, Father, you continue to be with us, Father, and especially, Father, those who have lost loved ones, Father, pandemic and the sickness, Father. And Father, the ones that are not here today, Father, not here in the world, Father, just be with them, just give them your love, Father. Father, the ones that are here, Father, you know our hearts. Bless this offering.
Remember now in Isaiah, well, we're talking about help for today, but he gave help for his time and, and all the time in between. But remember the key is in Isaiah chapter 40. And if you would look at that, even though we have gone farther than that, and we put the emphasis on the fact that it's time to start comforting God's people. God's people have to be reprimanded sometimes. They have to be judged, but they need to be comforted. And God does that in the midst of all of that. He doesn't just wait until it's over. But remember the key in Isaiah 40, verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Why, even young people can faint and be weary, and young men can fall. But they, here it is, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Comfort, at the beginning of that chapter, he says, comfort my people. He prophesies about the coming of John the Baptist, who is going to introduce the Messiah. All of this is about God taking care of the immediate problems and the problems that might come next week and the problems way down the line. In, in chapter 43, it says at the end of the first verse, I have redeemed you. And I have called you by my name, thou art mine. Now, Israel, the northern kingdom, has been taken by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom is going to be taken by the Babylonians when that time comes. Isaiah not only sees that coming, but he sees the restoration coming. And he sees uh, a nation that God uses. And we can apply that to any nation that the enemy might try to use and that God will use and the plan of God it doesn't matter if it's Assyria or Babylon or Rome if it's any of these nations that seem to identify with the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream and Daniel interpreted no matter who it is God knows what's taking place and God sometimes is going to use the troubles of this world to purify his people and to make his people like he wants them to be but ultimately he wants to redeem them and he wants to call them by his name and he says you are mine when you pass through the water, I'm going to be with you. Oh, there's going to be some rough times, Judah. Sometimes it's not because you deserve it. Sometimes it is. You know, you sold to the flesh, you're going to the flesh with maybe corruption. But sometimes God allows people who haven't sold to the flesh to go through the water. But he said, I'll be with you. You go through the rivers, they won't overflow you. When you walk through the fire, they will not burn you. Because I am the Lord. Your God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior, I would give Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia. I'll, I can give up Assyria. I can give up any, anything. It is, is nothing because it's all worth it to me because you're precious in my sight. See, that's the thing that counts most of all. You're precious in my sight. There's going to be, and I, I want to make sure that I have a chance to get to this before the communion because it's so important. My wife was reading from the Daily Devotional just recently. And I was talking about Daniel when he saw that the 70 years was just about finished. And so that Judah would go home. Judah would go home. Remember, we, we talked about Cyrus being named here. We're going to mention that just a little bit this morning, but not much. God, God spoke about a man a hundred years before he was born that was going to be used to bring them home and pay the bill. The king of Persia. When Isaiah said this, Babylon wasn't a great nation. Persia wasn't a great nation. And so Babylon's coming. Persia's going to grow and conquer them. And Cyrus is going to come to the throne. And God said he's going to pay the bill. He's going to let my people come home. Daniel saw that in 70 years. But right after that, Daniel saw the 70 weeks vision of weeks of years. 
over 400 years down the line. And we've done this in Bible studies, and we're not going to do it this morning, but you can take Daniel's vision of the 70 weeks. It's actually 69 weeks, but the week of years, seven years displaced. And it takes you right to the time when Jesus came. And when you know what God's showing Daniel? I can deliver people from, from Babylon, but it's going to have to be better than that. I can, I, I can save you from the Assyrians as they come to your town of Jerusalem. I can, I can deliver you back after 70 years. I can bring you back and restore you from all over the world after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. And even today there is a restoration to Israel in, in a physical sense. I can restore my people, but there has to be a restoration built around something that's permanent, and that's going to have to be the Messiah. It's going to have to be the Jesus of the New Testament. This is what they missed at that first Passover experience uh, in, in that, not the first Passover, but the first one uh, when Jesus went and became the Passover lamb. And he is now the Passover. See, Daniel saw that coming. People said, boy, it's amazing that Daniel could see Cyrus for 100 years. He saw, he, he saw Jesus 400 years ahead of time. He saw Christmas. And those numbers, when you get the right calendar, I, I, I've had for, uh, evangelical God-fearing professors do this in school. Folks, you can take it right down. And, and you don't, and people say, I don't care what the book of Daniel was written. How do you get it down to where you get, you get the Messiah coming? See, people say, oh, they didn't know he was coming. Y yes, they did. They just didn't want to admit it. We don't know when he's coming the second time, but he told Daniel when he was coming the first time. What do you think got a hold of the, the Magi when Daniel showed them this and then they get to figure this out and pass it down and then those ones who came to Bethlehem? How did they know it was his star? How did they know that the king of the Jews was being born. God with his word and God with the Holy Spirit and with this testimony. But that's, a, that's another thing here. God is saying there's going to be a restoration which is going to be good in their day and it's going to be good in my day in 2021 because we need it any day we live and it has to be Jesus. Everything else is temporary. See, Everything else is temporary. See, here's the restoration. I, I, in verse 6 of chapter 43, I'll say to the north, give up. And to the south, keep my back. Bring my sons from afar. Bring my daughters from the end of the earth. I want everybody that's called by my name. I've created them for my glory. I've formed them. I've made them. Bring the blind people that have eyes and the deaf people that have ears. And let all nations be gathered together. See? Look at verse 18 of chapter 43. God's bringing us back. Remember, not the former things. Don't consider the things of old. I will do a new thing. It's going to be a new thing with Cyrus. It's going to be a new thing with Jesus, though, that's going to last forever. Don't you know it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. See, there's going to be a restoration. Look at verse 21. This people have I formed for myself that they would show forth my praise. Israel has gotten weary sometimes of God. God's people sometimes let God's down. But God says, you're my people, and I have formed you for my praise. And I'm here to take care of these things. See, Cyrus can come, and Cyrus can go. In chapter 45, they talk about it. My anointed, he can come and go. But what happens if you don't have a Cyrus? That's why you need Jesus. There's not always going to be a Cyrus. There's not always going to be a Savior in the flesh. There's not always going to be a liberator. There's not always going to be an answer to your problems and my problems. But there's always going to be a Jesus, see. So I say Cyrus comes and Cyrus goes, see. And you can read about that, like I said, in these first eight verses of chapter 45. But look, look at verse 17. Israel will be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Cyrus's deliverance is going to last a while, but Israel will be saved with an everlasting salvation. You will not be ashamed nor confounded. It will be world without end. World without end. Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens. God himself that formed the earth and made it. He has established it. He created it and not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I'm the Lord and there is nobody else. This world belongs to Jesus. Belongs to the Son of God, under the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Man might try to ruin things. Man might try to fix things. But both of those things will not work. It's going to be Jesus. 
It's going to be the power of God. And, and yes, it comes up a lot, and I'm going to say it every time. I, I have no use for anything that says that God didn't create us. That God didn't create this world. That this world doesn't belong to God. I, that's not science. It's not science. Notice that people that use science only use it when it's convenient. If it goes their way, they don't use it when it doesn't go their way. Well, real science, the truth about the world, the real scientific truth about the world is, is of God. See? I, never, I, never, I never got any comfort from the world's explanation. And I always get comfort from God saying, thus saith the Lord. And I want you to know that God doesn't contradict real science, and real science doesn't contradict God, and God did create. God did say that there be light. God did make the heavens and the earth. He is the creator, and he said it's going to last. This is what you want to put the emphasis on. I don't know how God's going to do it, how he's going to work it all out, exactly what it's going to be, be like, but he said he did not form this world to be uh, not inhabited. It was to be inhabited. It's for God's people. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I have spoken in secret in a dark place. But I declare things that are right. God is correct. Now, now listen. God is against man's attempt at salvation. See? God, God is against man's attempt at salvation. If you go to chapter 47, look at verse 12. Stand now. He's not talking. He's talking to what, what's going to happen. It was already happening in the Syria, but what's going to happen in Babylon? You know, people believe in all kinds of foolish things. False science. False knowledge. Stand now, you with your enchantments. And with the multitude of your sorceries. You're wearied in the multitude of counselors. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that have come upon thee. He says, not going to help you, Israel. Don't listen to any wise people from Assyria or Babylon or any other nation. Those nations around Israel were, were, were looking to false gods and praying to false gods. He said, it's not going to do you any good. They're not going to save you from anybody. They can't save you from the Assyrians. They can't save you from the Babylonians. They can't save you from the Romans. Only, only I can save you. And all of these lies and false teachings will be a stubble. And the fire will burn them. They will not deliver themselves. Thus shall they be unto thee whom thou hast labored. Even thy merchants from thy youth. They shall wander everyone to his quarter. And nobody from that crowd. Nobody in, in, the, in the name of man and with the techniques of man and with the, whether it seems to be uh, spiritual by some false enchantments or just natural by, by science so-called, it's not going to save you. Even things that are true and, and not necessarily wrong in this world are just of this world. And this world will pass away. It will not save you. See? It will not deliver you. And so God says, don't trust the arm of flesh because the arm of flesh will fail you. They that wait upon the Lord. What did it say? What's the key? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Well, there's an awful lot of talk, and people say, well, we, aren't you glad we can get to the New Testament? Well, yes, I am, but what do you, what do you have in mind when you say that? Well, I want to make sure that there's room for me, huh? because I'm not Jewish. I'm not, I'm not of Judah. And God's talking about his people, and he's going to restore his people, and he's going to have his people. And what about me? I don't think I came from the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, folks, you don't have to go to the New Testament for that. that, that that's there. But look at what it says. Look at what Isaiah gets from God in chapter 49, verse 5. The Lord that, that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him, he says, Though Israel be not gathered, yet I will be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. In other words, let me get this started right. Israel, Israel, if they weren't saved, if nobody in Israel turned to God, Isaiah said, I can be saved. Even if all of Israel doesn't, doesn't get gathered back, and they will, but if they don't, I will be okay because God's my strength. My strength. But you say, well, Isaiah was still of, of Judah. He was still an Israelite. Okay. Look at this. God said, it is, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Israel and to restore the preserved of Israel. He said, it's a light thing. It's not a big deal. 
God to bring them back from Egypt, God to bring them back from Babylon, God to bring them back as happened in the 1940s. Whatever restoration God does, it's no, it's no big problem for God. God. God's not saying, oh, I just used my last bit of strength to save my people. It's a, on top of all of that, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. Everybody in the whole world that they may be my salvation at the end of the earth. Going to all the world to preach the gospel. Jesus came to his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him, they gave me power to become the sons of God. See, So that we're, we're all coming in, folks. We're all coming in. The kings will rise, princes shall worship. In an acceptable time, in the day of salvation, we will be preserved. And God will give us a, as a covenant for the people to establish the earth and the cause to inherit the desolate heritages. You will say to the prisoners, go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves and they'll be fed in the ways and their pastures shall be in the high places. This is for, the, this is for all of God's people and all of the Gentiles that would want to, want to turn. We become, we become Israel. You won't be hungry, you won't be thirsty, you won't be hot from the sun. God will have mercy on you. And I will make all my mountain away and the highway shall be exalted. They're going to come from afar. Oh, he said, from the north and the west. Sing, heavens. Be joyful, all earth, and break forth into singing. Mountains for the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. Oh, listen. That's why we celebrate communion, because Jesus gave him all. Listen, wise counselor, Jesus said, teacher of the Jews, Synagogue master, listen to me, Nicodemus. God so loved the world, his world. Not Abraham's descendants, but everybody. God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's what I'm here for. You've got to be born again to become a new Christian.